Welcome to the ClassCast podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we'll be speaking with Tina Groger, the author of The Education Trap, Schools and the Remaking of Inequality in Boston. This is a really interesting topic because it deals both with the purpose of school and sort of the goals of what we want to do with schools, but also addresses maybe some of the shortcomings or perhaps our social blind spots, the things that we're not thinking about when we assume that schools can remedy some of the other inequalities and problems we, we see. So this is very much in the spirit of the ClassCast podcast. I'm really excited about this discussion. Tina, thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. Okay. So so that I don't misrepresent or explain it poorly, um, I know that the book addresses issues of, of social inequality and how that interplays with public education, but so that listeners understand sort of where you're coming from and the book that you're, you've been working on, right? It's, it's about to be published. Um, let, let's start there, sort of go with a, a quick overview, and we'll use that as a starting point for our conversation. So what is The Education Trap really all about? Yeah, so there's a long-standing idea, um, dates back to at least Horace Mann in the mid-19th century, that schools are the great equalizer, right? That like schools can help transform society um, and especially um, level level the playing field, create more um, opportunities for everyone and reduce social inequality. And I think this is this idea that education can solve, you know, really broad sweeping social problems is, is very much alive today. Um, and we see this rhetoric all over both sides of the political aisle. Um, but I think the the reason why I call the, this sort of thinking a trap um, is because I think it can obscure the way that education actually, you know, historically, as it developed in the U.S., um, always very much in in kind of interacting with the with the economy, with inequalities in the economy, um, it became a really effective way at concentrating wealth and power um, in certain certain cases, um, as well as creating opportunities for some social mobility and inequality. So um, if we, we need to, yeah, sort of see, see the ways that education can actually deepen inequality um, and the rhetoric, the sort of constant positive rhetoric, I think can kind of, right, as you said, blind us to some of these potential pitfalls. Yeah, and and I I, I love the way you know you, you're concerned about the the, the positivity because this is uh I've gotten more involved on like Twitter since I started the podcast just as a way to contact other people, but also you know to promote a little bit. And I I, I make memes sometimes. That's my new thing when I get frustrated with my job. I make memes about it, <laughs> and I don't share any of the really mean ones. But I have a few that are just just ripping up teacher Twitter for the constant positivity, not because mm. I think it's bad to be positive, but sometimes people aren't willing to engage with the negative aspects of what we do in school. And I think that that's a problem because it doesn't let us get better. And, and it's possible that some of this is systemic that, you know, maybe we can't get better or, or we have to make really big changes in order to do it. Um, but I find that there are a lot of, a lot of classroom teachers, K through 12 teachers who are not real eager to engage in those parts of the discussion. Mm. And, and for me, that frustrates me because I think, you know, I'm a good teacher, but I'm still working within a framework that I can't really control. You know, I, I don't get to pick how we schedule the classes or who has access to them or the funding or any of the rest. So I can do the, you know, the best I can in the classroom, but that's such like a small piece of a mm -hmm. really big system, you know, that even, even if a kid gets lucky and has a handful of really good teachers, you still had a bunch of mediocre or bad ones. And you were still in the system that really sort of imposed a lot of things into your life and into your family. So with that, like if, if we could think about the purpose of school in general, because obviously the book is, is addressing the ideas of whether or not public education can be some sort of panacea for all the other things that we're dealing with. And, and you know, I'm assuming the answer is probably not. But um, to you, what is the purpose of school? Good, good question. Yeah, I mean, I want to. So I'll, I will say like one of the other themes or important aspects of this debate is is like the way that so much you know putting all this pressure on schools to solve all our social problems when i see you know some of the the major ways that the major problems that we might want to tackle for instance social inequality you know just schools are not like the biggest lever um so a good teacher or a bad teacher is not actually sort of the primary 
culprit or the primary, you know, attributor to anything good that happens. It's actually a lot more about the um, the power of workers in the economy. That's sort of where I place like that has the most impact on whether or not we have a more egalitarian society or not. I'll also say I think when we think about education, we tend to think about like schools in a formal sense. But one of the other arguments I want us to think through is just like learning happens everywhere. It's only fairly historically recently that formal education you know, has taken up such a big part of our lives. But that's not to say that like people weren't learning before. And I talk a lot about, you know, work, learning on the job, learning in your community and your family. Um, education is sort of always happening and people are shaped through those experiences as much as through, you know, a formal school setting. Um, but I think historically the purpose of education um, has been about, you know, passing on forms of knowledge that usually a, a sort of middle class um, forms of knowledge and cultural, cultural or civic knowledge are, are deemed important. It also functions as a way to socialize usually young people right into good habits um, that again are kind of imagined to be useful for young people later on in life. But then also as you, as schools become more and more important in society, I think they increasingly play this like to the extent that you're included or if you are included, then some people have to be excluded. So um, there's always sort of both inclusion and exclusion going on in a school, in in like the school hierarchy. Yeah, so school does, you know, a lot of things. <laughs> and and I've actually mm -hmm. just in the last maybe year started making the argument that maybe we do too many or we try to do too many. Um, you know, as the rhetoric around like defunding police became more popular, I, I you know, it really hit me like, you know, we're doing a lot of like social services and meal programs and things that not to say right. that school's a bad distribution point, but it, it puts a lot of responsibilities, you know, in a, in a school system, you know, a school superintendent or even a, a building principal has far more responsibilities now than they did 75 years ago. And then you say, well, you know, what, look at, look at the returns. And it's like, well, one, I think that in most cases, school's going better than it was in the past. Uh, you know, testing data can be skewed whichever way you want. But I don't know that it's going so much better that we should feel super proud about it. And part of it's that we're trying to do so many things. You you pointed to a middle class focus in your answer there. So you said the kind of knowledge and, and things like that. And I'm not sure, like my my personal sort of bias on it. I, I feel like a lot of it skews to more of an upper class kind of thing because you know we have kids sitting and I teach in a in an affluent area. I live in a very middle class place, but I drive a county over to work and. Those, those kids are, you know, most of them are pushing for Ivy League, you know, admissions and all this kind of stuff. And I remind them frequently that the things that seem so important for them to learn, they will probably never use again. Not that they shouldn't mm -hmm. learn it. Like, I love knowing stuff, but let's be realistic about what you actually need. And so when you say sort of that, that middle class knowledge or those behavioral norms and things like that, is that one, I mean, is, is that what you believe in two? Do you think that's by design because there are parts of this that really, from the late 1800s, that really do sort of mirror, you know, watered down elements of a university sort of style, you know, lecture, take notes, take your test, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is that, it is education, say policy and content driven by the middle class in your view? So here I would say, hist and, and this is sort of, right, I'm speaking about like what, what I see the purpose as being historically, and I'll talk more later, I think about what like I would would want to see or potential, you know, different, different directions. But I think um, one of my big arguments is that in the United States, the, the success of schools, both in the private sector and public schools was very close. And, and by success, I mean, like, support for their expansion, like actual students enrolling in them, that was really driven by um, the labor market in a lot of ways. So like the reason why high schools expand in the early 20th century is because they provide a very effective training for new emerging white collar jobs. Um, so you're, this is a period of like huge corporate bureaucracies that are growing and a lot of women, working class, kind of second generation immigrants that 
um, might not have connections to those, to, you know, to businesses, to other kinds of establishments through like family connections, because that's how people used to get jobs, right? right? They can use schools to access those skills um, and then enter the white collar workforce. And, and that, I think, sort of that success story for specific groups of students at a specific time, like in this, um, in this period where those jobs were seen as, or, you know, they were preferable kinds of employment. Um, that explains a lot about, you know, why we, why historically, like the idea that schools can help you access the American dream, like it was rooted in, it's not like a, you know, a total myth, like it was really rooted in experiences like that. And um, yeah, so I think the economy, that's why the, the, the types of jobs that are expanding really do and have shaped our educational system. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's a, I almost feel like it's like the chicken and the egg, you know, because you reference, you know, access to new jobs and say the immigrant situation. I don't remember which, I think it's Malcolm Gladwell book. I don't remember which one uh, where he talks about people going to New York city public schools. And I, I want to say it was like the 1940s and fifties. It might've been just before that, but he talked about how being a public school teacher was like one of the best sort of middle-class jobs around mm -hmm. because of benefits and pay. But as a result, you had this sort of like higher competition for the jobs. And, and so he, he, he connects a bunch of dots as he does in his books to, to basically point out that there was this sort of much larger sort of ecosystem that supported the success of the schools and all these kids that went through the public schools that end up starting businesses and become, you know, leaders in the community and that kind of stuff. And, and I think, and again, I'm, I'm reaching, it's been a couple of years since I've read this, but that he pointed to some of the differences, say in like the rates of success or the, you know, the, the student experience is that essentially we're not in that time. <laughs> like it's not the teacher, it's not the school. It's, the, it's just the entire sort of context of it was really important. And that right. in certain points you see it as like this perfect storm that leads to great success because you have all the right you know, sort of influences and factors that will motivate the right people to be teaching or that students see the, the goals and the outcomes. And other times, maybe we don't. When we think about, say, economic, the economic influences, you know, to put it broadly, how much of this is the chicken versus the egg? Like, is school reacting to the economy or is the economy reacting to school? And I'll toss my, I just, I, I am getting frustrated. I'm in my 15th year teaching. And the more of these podcasts I do, I'm driving myself crazy because I think of all the awesome things school could do. And then I look at how few of them we actually do, right? Like we're very slow to change. It's very stubborn. Mm -hmm. So is school in certain ways reacting to the economy, albeit maybe slowly, or is it the other way around that schools are creating workers and then the economy has to do whatever it's going to do with them? Like which one is a primary driver? Mm. Yeah, no, good, good. Or great question. Um, and I think it's both, although I think it's also different depending on what like institution we're talking about. Um, and like both, both uh, directions can be happening simultaneously. So for example, I, I, so I just told this story about like the role of public high schools for this new cohort of white collar workers. I also are this, and this is in the early 20th century. A normal a story that economists might tell about, you know, if if more people go to school um, and acts, then, then they are able to access these jobs, um, and that's going to decrease inequality because you know you have a bigger pool of people competing over good jobs. That sort of lowers, puts downward pressure on wages. Um, but actually, what we see in the early 20th century is that inequality goes up. Um, so like, you know, how can we make sense of this? Another dynamic that's happening in this period is as more, as sort of high school becomes something now, like a mass institution that lots and lots of students are getting, um, it's no longer a sort of privileged elite, um, you know, a kind of just college preparatory classical education that it used to be. And so at the same time that public high schools are booming and like immigrants are entering these new jobs, we also see a reaction among, you know, professional and economic elites to use and develop higher education. And I write about Boston and in Boston, it's entirely private 
private higher education because they, <laughs> they those institutions are not going to let like a public university uh, be founded in Boston until really late until the 1960s. But um, they basically develop connections with um, economic elites to kind of like create um, a bigger role for college credentials in accessing corporate, you know, these new sort of at the very top level corporate jobs or new professions like corporate law that are developing at this time. So it's sort of um, in that way we can see it's still, it's, I guess I wouldn't say like, what, right, it's, it's a chicken and egg in the sense that like both are shaping each other, but it's a very dynamic process. And often there are different interest groups that are pushed, you know, and I would, I would think about it more as like who has power in politics and the economy. And if economic elites are now like seeking out college colleges, you know, making connections with um, university administrators um, are starting to employ college graduates, like these, these things are kind of mutually constitutive, but they can really shape, they can shape each other. And I, I, talk about the ways that essentially like business as a profession or business management really comes out of a reaction to what's going on in like lower levels of education and the economy. Okay. Yeah. It. So I'm, I'm going to ask this question and I, I, I may regret it later. I don't know. I, I'm not asking as, as I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, you know, so, so to speak, but when, when you talk mm -hmm. about sort of educational or political elites and the influence they may have on schools, do you see this either now or historically? Like, is, is there like a small group, like an inner circle that you saw, say like in, in your book, let's, let's just stick with Boston yeah. uh, for the sake of simplicity in that setting you know, sort of looking at, at, at a large city, uh, you know, in, in the state of Massachusetts, are we talking about this inner circle that is really pulling strings and driving a lot of this, or is this, you know, it looks like somebody's doing, I don't know. I just, I feel like when I see a lot of conspiracy theories, I just think like it's, <laughs> it's, it's almost impossible to get a sizable number of people to keep their mouths shut and actually work together well. And so I think most conspiracies fall apart because you just, you can't get that many people to all work together to make something happen. Mm -hmm. But in a setting like this, maybe it's possible for there to be a small enough group to drive policy change and things like that, and still to maintain some confidence and, and a little bit of mm. secrecy with it. Is, is that really what you saw as you did your research? Like a small group, yeah. you know, driving this or? Um, so I think there, there is like a tradition in educational history that um, sort of a, you know, a, a Marxist or like a Foucauldian tradition in, in the history of education that, that would describe schools as um, like top down institutions that are like controlled by the economic elite to sort of shape shape a new workforce and and like which gives which gives students and parents and even like teachers very little agency and i, I think i really see um a lot of different organized interests you know in conflict sometimes working in coalition but i see a lot of bottom-up pressure for like school for school expansion um and i don't think that we can explain much about the history if we just saw it as like a as an elite institution. I think we there is a lot of evidence for like grassroots support for high schools and even for universities. Um, I think what allows it this this sort of gets back to this the education trap idea that that like because it's so because I think there is so much support and there's, there's sort of lived experience in education really helping, you know, large groups of, of people. This feeds this idea that more education is a good thing and more education can, you know, create so opportun economic opportunity. It can, um, it can help students succeed. So even as elites are kind of behind the scenes, I think there is definitely behind the scenes, you know, I, I look at a lot of correspondence between employers and like college placement officers, essentially saying like, we want to recommend this student, you know, they're a, 
they were on the crew team and like they have uh, Protestant parents and um, <laughs> you know they, they're they're doing this sort of dealing behind the scenes, but outwardly this is you know people are looking at universities and seeing oh a college credential is a path into a very high paying job you know I should want my son or daughter to get that kind of education. Um, and it becomes a popular, like expanding education becomes a really popular policy solution across classes, because I think this idea takes hold that that education is, you know, one of the best ways of achieving social mobility. So, yeah, so that's, that's how I would sort of see a combination of, you know, we can, we can analyze historically, like what was really going on. Um, but that isn't to say that, you know, everyone was, uh, that they had total control. Like you needed a, you needed a broad coalition politically to actually expand schools and to, you know, to, to do what they were doing. Yeah. So it's, it's such a tricky thing. Cause in there, you know, you pointed out that the idea of expanding schools and that, you know, saying more education is a good thing. I get stuck on this because I like, I agree in the broad sense, more education for people is good. The more, you know, about the world, the more options you have. And, and I've said this before on the podcast, but you know, I, I, it drives me crazy when people say knowledge is power. Cause I'm like, well, <laughs> you know something, but you don't possess the ability to use it in any way. Like it's not that yeah. it hurt you to know it, but it, it's useless, right? Knowledge creates options and options create power. So the more, you know, the more choices you might get to make and then making those choices can potentially be empowering. Right. But simply, you know, knowing it doesn't necessarily mean it creates an option depending on your situation and your community, et cetera. Right. And when I hear people say, you know, well, more education is better. Yes. But to what extent? I'm, you know, I'm sure we all know somebody who spent a lot of time in college and then ended up with a job, you know, completely unrelated to anything they studied. And, you know, they have tons of degrees and don't use it. And is it bad that they got it? No, but I also don't know if it's an automatic ticket to success or wealth or, you know, whatever. And, and so we think about, say, just that organic learning, like you, you pointed out earlier that a lot of the learning we do is actually outside of school. Um, mm -hmm. And you actually mentioned, you know, learning loss. I have an episode where I basically just go off on the idea of learning loss <laughs> and, and to the point where like I borderline regret a couple of things I say, but I'm just, I'm going to let it fly <laughs> just because like, there's, there's no such thing, <laughs> right? Like people are always learning. Right. The question is, what are you learning? And do, do other people recognize it? Are there people willing to yeah. see it? And, and so to what extent can we use it? we sort of talk about school like this egalitarian concept, as you pointed out, that somehow this is the thing that maybe can remedy some of our social ills and, and, and all the rest. Um, actually about, I don't know, a third, maybe half of the way through Michael Sandel's new book, Tyranny of Merit. I don't know oh, if you know yeah. me, professor at Harvard, uh, great, great philosophy. I, I love, I love the guy. Great, great books. And in it, you know, over and over, it keeps going back to merit. And if you think about it, school is a meritocratic institution like it's very utilitarian. Like we just sort of, here's a curriculum that we think everyone will work with and we roll with it. But in the end, it's a system that depends so heavily on grading and leveling students and all the rest. It's really hard to imagine how we think that is going to lead to a more egalitarian society, right? Like if, if what you do after high school depends at least in some cases, and you know, some cases it depends a lot on how well you do in high school. I don't mm. know that that's something that's actually increasing equality you know, or freedom in the society, if you compel people to attend school and then sort them and grade them, and then their future opportunities are based upon how they did at something when they were 17, you know, which might right. be a very poor indicator of how you're going to do when you're 37 or 47 or whatever. Um, I, I have a lot of concerns about that piece. Like, is school supposed to build on those merits or are we supposed to create this equality of opportunity that makes for the more egalitarian society like that. I know that that's a little more of a philosophical twist, but it, I feel like we're talking out of both sides of our mouth, right? We're, we want this equality piece, but then everything we do is based on merit and merit of young people, which is insane because how many people were really that good mm. at things when they were 15, right? It, it's not the best indicator. Is that part of your concern that, you know, like we can't necessarily create equality of opportunity in a system that itself is so unequal or is that an unfair representation? Yeah. So I'm, I think there's a few things here. I think one is about just like, what, what is the content 
of schooling and what's learned and how that connects to, you know, things that go on afterwards. And I think that, I think we can, we can look historically at like what has shaped a lot of the content of schools. And that I think has some connections to, to jobs, especially sort of white collar jobs, um, but also has, you know, developed kind of separately and on its own. Um, and sometimes there's a real disconnect between what is being learned and jobs later on. Um, the other, I guess another side of this that one, one of the arguments I make is that we have this idea that I think is, you know, related to this question of merit that, you know, if you learn a lot of skills in school, um, that these skills are going to be rewarded with higher wages in the labor market. And this is sort of the classic, like, economic idea of human capital, right? And I mean, human capital is this like very broad term that doesn't really get into the content very much, but basically is sort of education is like a proxy for these things called skills. And then higher skilled people will be able to get higher skilled jobs, which usually means higher wages. And I think that equation you know, there's so many things um, wrong <laughs> with that equation and with that assumption. Um, and part of it is about, right, about the content of like, what are the skills that you're learning? But the other part is just, is about what's actually going on in the labor market. And I think at a time when job, white collar jobs were booming and, you know, we can look to the middle of the 20th century when, workers had a lot of power when there were a lot of like good paying unionized manufacturing jobs. So you could get a basic education, literacy, numeracy in school and then access a, a well-paying job. Um, and now what we're seeing is, you know, the hollowing out of the economy, increasing, you know, stagnant wages for most people. So even if you have really you know, high skills, um, and you are extremely well educated, that is now in our economy, that's no guarantee of actually getting a job. So we're sort of missing the picture if we think that it only depends on, you know, what goes on in school. Um, and we can re I mean, I think it's, it's important to rethink, you know, what are we actually teaching people? Are these skills, things that are, are valuable beyond, you know, the academic setting? But um, but then the next question is, OK, but still like after school um, entering the labor market, like what kind of labor market is it? And is it going to reward any kind of skill um, if if there aren't sort of jobs to go into? So that so that's sort of one of my my arguments that we focus a lot on, like experiment with vocational training or other forms of education. But that doesn't answer the the, the job piece of it at the end, which I see as, as, as sort of just as important, if not more important. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and there, there's a couple ways, I guess, to think about schooling is that, you know, is this just sort of purely personal development and, you know, enlightening the individual. And I think that's sort of the, the classical sort of idea right. versus how much of this is vocational training. And I talked with Jeremy Wayne Tate, who leads the, I forget the CLT exam, which is like a it's, it's really kind of, it's, it's kind of niche at the moment, but they are growing and they're trying to be an alternative to SAT and ACT. It's very popular in Christian private schools and with homeschool students. And mm -hmm. he talks a lot about that is that, you know, education is supposed to enlighten you. It's supposed to help you understand what is beautiful and to think and all that. And it's hard to argue that historically, like, you know, people who have gone through that classical model have often done very well. That being said, they also on average were wealthy people who already had these families with the connections. And, and so it's something that like, he's one of my favorite people on Twitter to follow. Cause he puts out a lot of like awesome, like one sentence things that you'll either agree or disagree. Like it's, it's hard to read any of it and be in the middle, you know? And so I, I love going back and <laughs> forth with him, but I, I always try to point out like, yeah, but you're ignoring all the people who used to get apprenticeships and, and all the people who just mm. learned, you know, the family business, they didn't go through that style of education. And, and so he, and, and I think a lot of people in that sphere are concerned about sort of the STEM and STEAM focus in school or, or the, the mm -hmm. purely vocational aspects and says that a, a great education is more than that. And I would agree. I think a great education is more than that, but maybe that still needs to be a part of it. Right. And 
one of the things that makes this difficult is that we have this tendency to write our curriculum and to do these structural pieces, not at a local level, but it's state or say with common core, it's national. I feel like we're maybe missing the opportunity to allow communities to sort of design systems that would support themselves in a way. So like uh, David Simon, the writer of the show, The Wire, uh, which a you know, great show, but in, in a documentary about the, I forget what it was, the war on drugs. I think it's called the house, the house I live in it's on the war on drugs. But he talks about the number of like high school kids who end up like selling drugs in Baltimore and other inner city areas. And he goes, but think about it. All the factory jobs are gone. None of the white collar jobs are accessible to these kids. Even if a lot of these kids go through and they do fine in school, how many of them are going to be able to go to college, pay for it? And then even if they get the degree, how many of them are getting through the interview process when people are so mm -hmm. sort of narrowly focused on the quote unquote kind of person they want? And so he says that it, the equivalent of, say, a kid in a, in a poor, poor inner city neighborhood deciding to sell drugs or you know do something like that, he said it's the equivalent of like working for the company in a company town you know, 150 years ago, he says that it, they're making a perfectly rational decision. Mm -hmm. It only looks irrational from people outside of that situation. But if people in the community can acknowledge that and say city leadership can say, well, these are the kinds of businesses we wish we had or the kind of factories we want to bring back, would it be smart to allow more local control? Because you sort of pointed to the difference between say the, the college prep or the access to white collar jobs versus the vocational piece. And and, you know, I personally think we should be doing at least a little bit of all of it, but not forcing everyone to do all of it. Like I personal belief is I think kids should have way more freedom in what they choose to do inside of school. But that requires that, you know, the grownups around them one see value in it and to provide it. Do you think that some of these issues of, of say, the economics in a, in a community, in a city or in a town, could we improve that situation by allowing that city or town to flex schools in the direction they want? Like, is local control a meaningful thing in this conversation? Interesting. Um, so let me let me go back first to the- Sorry, the I ramble in, sometimes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 um, no I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get there to local control. But first on the kind of education as enlightenment and you know, liberal versus vocational education. I, I think this is another, you know, one of my, one of my pet arguments is that we have constructed this you know dichotomy between liberal versus vocational education and i think both on the political left and the political right have versions of what a like true liberal education would be but on the political right it's usually you know a classical curriculum or like great books or some you know religious learning on the left, it would be, you know, about self-discovery and imagination and creativity. And vocational is usually kind of like denigrated, like, you know, it's it's liberal and it's not, ha that has nothing to do with, you know, work or careerism. Um, it doesn't have like instrumental value. It's just about the mind. And I think historically, um, I mean, there are different political uses of that argument today, but I think historically that was often a way of, again, like sort of obscuring the way that, you know, liberal education was actually one of the most well-structured pathways into a well-paying job because those were like professionals uh, were the only people getting like a long period of formal education that was supposedly liberal or classical. So so I would want to, I would argue that actually like liberal education is not, is also vocational in the sense that it just was vocational for, you know, upper class jobs um, or professional jobs. <laughs> A narrower look at the vocations available, but yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and so there are um, vocational aspects in effect. Um, they have functioned at, as sort of vocational training for the upper class. Um, so that's sort of one I think one argument, I think, so rather than, um, than maybe like local control in, in shaping communities, like, I think, you know, if the, if the problem is that there aren't like good jobs for people to go into in a local community, I think there, I would, I would be interested in thinking about like, what are the ways of empowering workers or, you know, community members, 
in that community in a really broad sense, and maybe schools would be part of that, but also it would be, and this, this gets back to this question of like, what, what maybe could be the purpose of education or what would be other kinds of educational models? Like, I think the experience of organizing, of trying to, trying to work with other people in one's workplace, in one's community to actually like collectively build some power to talk about, you know, what are shared grievances? What's, what sort of the analysis of who has power in the community? How can we, how can we build more power for ourselves? How do we do that for people that don't have a lot of political and economic power? Like the only way to do that is kind of through like collective action, right? Through, through creating like a, a mass movement. Those are skills and those are, that's sort of, again, like a kind of experiential education um, that I see is like, those are some of the most important skills that anybody could have in like a modern workplace, <laughs> like anywhere you are, you, you know, workplaces are so undemocratic and so unequal now, um, that any sort of skills to help people basically like empower themselves through working together, like that would be what I would hope, um, an alternative kind of education could be, and it wouldn't necessarily take place within a school, but again, like you can have these kinds of experiences in, in many settings. Um, and I think that's gonna be really important in if we are interested in you know, reducing inequality or trying to build back some of the power that, that working people have had in the past um, and trying to you know, create jobs with good working conditions and all that. So we, we've bumped into it twice now. Normally I hold, you know, the guests ideal school until a little bit later, but, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're, I feel like you're giving like half an answer because you're like, you're like, ideally the other, so just let, let's do it because it, it, we've sort of run into it twice. And since we're talking about say the way schools are and the way you see schools with the research you've done, I think it's probably impossible to do that kind of work and do that kind of research and not build new ideas about what would be better. And so there's a million different ways that things could be better and probably, you know, 10 million, they could be worse. Right. And so that, that, that's where we always have to be careful in these discussions. But for you thinking about whatever level of school, uh, try to keep it K-12, but elementary, high school, whatever, whatever you like, or all of the above, what would your ideal school be? Like if you were given a budget and you could create your own institution, what would your ideal school look like? whether it would, you know, run into any of these same problems or not, we can deal with later. But to you, what is the ideal school? Yeah. So I think like if, if I had been asked this question a few years ago, before I wrote my book, I would have, I would have given a, a different answer. And I think, um, you know, I, like I started when I got interested in education, I was very much like, I read a lot of John Dewey. I was really interested in his ideas of, how schools can kind of recreate the conditions of what, you know, what a democratic society would look like, but like in miniature and um, teach students the sort of skills and habits of democratic practice and scientific inquiry that then, then they can go on and basically like reshape, reshape society through this education that they've gotten in schools. And so the idea there that, you know, education is sort of the starting place for transforming society. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's sort of a key Dewey and idea that, that I think I used to agree with. <laughs> and now I, I, um, I am a lot more skeptical um, of what schools can do. And I, again, like, I guess, because I'm a historian, I want to think through like, you know, you can't just like, jump from one reality to another like we have to go through it step by step so um i'm skeptical of like an immediate change or like you know creating a separate school that could have a broader effect for me now i think what what i see is you know we we imagine or like do we imagine schools as being able to create a more egalitarian society for me now i think that um what's what's going to matter most for that is actually like how much power workers have so then so then the question is like how do you how do you teach that or how do you improve that how can you um foster those kinds of skills and those kinds of 
experiences. Um, and so I think for me, I've been thinking more about like, how, how would you create um, the kinds of conditions where everyone could have an experience of actually trying to build collective power or like organize a campaign um, in their community or in, um, in their workplace, in, in politics. And one that would just be, you know, outside of schools, right? As I was saying before, like trying to um, creating conditions where where workers can like organize a campaign for themselves and get that sort of practical experience. But I think there are also maybe opportunities of thinking about like, you know, rethinking what schools could do to teach students how to engage in those kinds of practices at a very young age. So um, in some ways this, this does, it, it would be kind of similar to Dewey's idea of like learning by doing or sort of having practical experience, but you know, actually trying to have projects where youth are engaged in like political action in their communities. Um, or, you know, now we're seeing uh, lots of labor organizing going on in schools themselves, like through kind of teacher organizing and, and the labor movement is, I think, becoming very real to students who see their teachers go on strike or their teachers, um, making arguments about why, you know, they're fighting for not just their rights, but also better learning conditions for their students or better resources for their communities. So I would see those kinds of experiences, which again, are like not, not so much formal, you know, classroom experiences, but kind of giving, giving students the ability to like participate in things that are going to allow them to empower themselves down the road in a lot of different ways. I mean, do you, do you envision that as something that could be done say, you know, partially in or partially out of school, or is this sort of a replacement? Like in, in your ideal school, would you keep math, English, science, history, you know, et cetera, <laughs> and then create some time, say at the end of the day where students worked collaboratively on whatever kind of community projects that interested them versus how much of this would be, you know, remove or reduce the emphasis on those traditional subjects. Because I, I feel like as, as where I work, there's been this huge push for project-based learning over the last mm -hmm. I don't know, five, six years. And I think initially just the way it was pitched, I think there is some, some resistance. And I think over time, most people have warmed up to the idea. The problem we keep running into though, is if you're really serious about making this work, it's crazy to think a kid's going to do a project in English and one in history and one in science and one in like, we need to tear down those walls a little bit, but the way we schedule kids, they don't all have the same teachers in the different subjects. Each teacher has to assign a grade to whatever, like the structure that we're in does not play nicely with this project based idea. If we're really serious about doing it. And so for me, I'm very much like, I just want someone to choose <laughs> like to, let's do one or let's do the other, but you, you can't tell me, you know, it, it's the the square peg in the round hole kind of thing that we can do really great project-based learning and really great student centered stuff while still maintaining our traditional, you know, program of studies and course requirements and all that. And, and right. I, to me, they look contradictory to a certain extent. So in your mind, is, is it really something that you would be supporting in school and students would engage in afterwards or as, as sort of an auxiliary function, or is this something that you, you could redesign the school day to allow for that kind of interaction? Yeah. Um, no, good question. I, I mean, I think I'm all, I'm like a little skeptical of, you know, um, any sort of like solution that would involve just a kind of like technocratic reorientation, <laughs> um, you know, or implemented down. Um, because I think in some ways what I'm talking about is like, is encouraging local communities and students and families to like, empower themselves through these types of practices. So it's not something you can just impose. Um, but I think so, I mean, I think like we're also getting at just sort of the constraints, I think of what education in this country now faces, which is you know, pressure to perform well on standardized tests, um, kind of this, a lot of structures that we, or are sort of imagined to be promoting quality education, but actually are 
are not, or, you know, or standardized yeah. tests. Our biggest hurdles are all self-imposed. <laughs> so it, yeah. Or, really, I mean, you know. so I, I, well, there's, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of limits in place that we would sort of have to, you know, try to first convince people that like our testing regime is really detrimental and not a good way of measuring student success or student progress before we can kind of reimagine the curriculum. But I think the kinds of experiences that, that I would be talking about, I think, yeah, they could, they could happen within school. I think they're already happening kind of informally in just in districts where, where teachers are organizing or there are, you know, we've seen high school activism and college activism and maybe probably even younger students um, getting involved in Black Lives Matter protests, you know, or gun violence protests um, across the country. So there are, I think there are already a lot of ways that students are getting involved and like learning some of these political skills informally, even if it's not part of their yeah. curriculum per se. Yeah, it, 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 there's some stuff you're saying. I just recently read... Um... Was it Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire? Uh-huh. That and so you know, it, it, I want to blame my my education on this, but like I'm like I had never heard of the guy until like a couple months ago. Uh, somebody was like went off about this stuff on Twitter, and I was like I don't know what they're talking about, but I feel like <laughs> I should read the book, you know. And and there's a lot like a lot of this project based learning and the student centered piece of it, I think, comes from his ideas, and I, I think probably politically is the reason that I hadn't heard the name or or. Mm-hmm perhaps one of my professors mentioned it, but I can guarantee, you know, we didn't spend any significant time. Like I know yeah. the name John Dewey. I did not know the you know? And, <laughs> and so what's really interesting though, is that some of that seems contradictory to the way we run schools. And so last mm-hmm. summer I talked to uh, her name's Katina Franklin Sweetie, and she's a, an employee operator of a local unschooling center. So kids essentially sign okay. themselves out of school and then they choose to go to this place and they, they could just hang out all day, but they choose what the classes will be offered and all that kind of stuff that creates that, I mean, it's a true democratic process. Like when there's a problem in the building, the kids, the, the quote unquote, the teachers, the adult advisors, they all, they vote on what they're going to do. They decide how long a class is going to run. Uh, there's a great deal of freedom in it, but it is, it's so contradictory to the way we currently run a school that you, you have to leave school to do it, you know? Yeah. And so when you think of this idea of like organizing or allowing students to, to work together and decide uh, what is a project that we want or a political movement we want to be involved in, I feel like a lot of the things you're saying would play out it, it, at least in terms of speed. I don't, I'm not saying they would work out best. I'm just saying like, if we wanted to implement your ideas next week, unschooling would actually be the, the easiest path to those opportunities. Not necessarily that I'm saying that it's best. I just don't know that schools offer the flexibility. So like with that idea of unschooling, is that, how does that fit into this discussion? Like is, is just leaving mm-hmm. the school system one way to achieve some of the opportunities that you're talking about, or is that something that would worry you? Yeah. So I think it's, it's ironic that in some of like Dewey's vision of progressive education, right. Was he imagined this as like, this is going to reshape all of our schools, but actually I think some of the places that on a curriculum level actually implemented some of his ideas were, you know, very like, small instances um, and often more wealthy school districts or like private schools that implemented some of these curricular ideas. And I think to me, that's, that's sort of the biggest problem with what you might call like a sort of utopian model of like, okay, well, the current system isn't working. Let's go off and like start our own community, school, whatever, um, and implement its own best practices is that, or, you know, freedom schools in the 1960s, like there, there have been movements, I think, before unschooling um, to, yeah, essentially opt out of the current system and try to start new experiments. And while I think um, there's value in, in those experiments, I'm, I worry that that, um, because they're often, you know, a tiny percent of the population um, and, often, although not always, but often those populations have some degree of, you know, wealth or financial independence that, that does it, that isn't representative of the broader population. That isn't a good method of, you know, working towards change on like a broader scale. So 
I think, I think the change is going to have to be slow. Um, we can't just write, like start from scratch, but there are like, I sort of see, see a lot of what's been happening in, I think in recent years in, in teacher organizing, you know, wildcat strikes across the South that, that, you know, we weren't really expecting um, in higher ed. I mean, this is my kind of entry into the labor movement or getting some experience was in a grad student unionizing campaign. Like there are a lot of organizing efforts among adjunct professors and other higher ed workers. And I think like kind of starting where people are, um, like currently, you know, in public, you know, public school teachers or staff, students like already in their institutions and trying to change them slowly um, from within, like that to me seems more positive than than a kind of like starting over from scratch. Right. Model. Yeah. That's actually that's the way you said that at the end, that's sort of been my argument is that, you know, it's the baby in the bathwater and that we have a lot of good things going for us. We have a structure, we have, you know, an extensive real estate portfolio, like we already have. So like, (laughs) you can imagine trying to just just start this over from scratch, like you wouldn't have buildings, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of good Mm -hmm. things we have. And the question is, are there ways to use them better? Probably, but then we have to agree on what those are. Um, Again, I think the unschooling thing is a really cool idea, but I I fully agree Mm -hmm. that there are some pieces of it that are very sort of niche and that not, not that not in the way they run it. I, I don't, I don't mean this is a criticism of, of say that organization or any other, but there's a piece of it. that's a little bit classist to assume that any person in any community can make the most of that opportunity. You know, there's a lot mm-hmm. of impoverished yeah. communities, especially in rural areas where you just don't have a lot of stuff around. And so the idea, like you, your access yeah. is limited. Um, the internet helps, but I don't know if it helps enough. And so, you know, you, you, you've pointed a couple of times to the idea of say, you know, unionizing and, and, that, that, that whole piece, sort of the labor movement and how that's playing into education. I teach in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And so just last year, the yeah. governor, the state legislature, they, they passed collective bargaining for public employees, for, for teachers. And then the governor delayed it a year because of the pandemic and the shutdown. It was supposed to go into effect last May and it's now been pushed to this May, but um, it looks like it's going to happen. I, I don't think there's going to be any more delays. And so I did an episode, um, I don't know, a couple months ago with the president of the local education association, which, Mm -hmm. you know, the sort of would be union, but now we got to get everybody to sort of sign their cards and and do the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, And, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm actually glad, you know, I'm not going to name him. I I try not to name people (laughs) unless they've been on the show, but I have a friend from high school who was a a professor, I guess an adjunct professor at Wash U in St. Louis. Uh, Brilliant, brilliant guy, you know, and, but he got, he got into the whole sort of the, the workers sort of conditions, you know, as a, as an adjunct professor in the pay yeah. and, and path to tenure and all this kind of stuff. And he actually got so good at it. Not only did they unionize there, but he left, I think he's a, uh, you know, what is it? EBD, everything, but dissertation on his doctorate. Uh-huh. And he now is a union uh, negotiator oh, in, wow. in Pennsylvania. He went back to where we grew up and that's what he does now. So I'm hoping to get him on the show because like, we're getting close. So when, when I have to talk to my, my coworkers about whether or not they're going to sign the cards and do whatever, like <laughs> I want to have a couple episodes and be like, you should listen to these people. Like mm-hmm. for, for you, do you think teachers unions are a path to educational progress. Like, I, I think it's a given that it's a path to improving the condition for teachers, whether mm-hmm. that's pay or benefits or, you know, whatever that is. But when we think about this from like the whole community perspective, or maybe from the individual student perspective, does teachers, the, does have, you know, giving teachers the opportunity to bargain collectively and unionize, do you think that that's going to have a positive, negative, or negligible effect on students? Like, how does that play out for non-teachers? Yeah, um, so I would say on the whole, like, short answer, I think a positive effect. Um, I, I think there's, you know, teachers unions historically have not always been um perfect. And, you know, back in the 60s, there were a lot of issues with, you know, primarily white teacher unions being pitted against black and brown communities that they taught in. But I think there are a lot of good models now for teachers really being on like the front lines, not just in their schools, but also in like their communities, in their cities for advocating for resources for schools that are going to help like their students, their families, um, and I live in Chicago. I think the Chicago Teachers Union um, 
is has kind of been leading on this front, but they've they've really made the case, and I think have successfully um, kind of organized not just amongst themselves, but also in reaching out to parents and students and families and saying like. What do, what do you all need? Like what would actually make for better schools and building this sort of platform um, where they can use their contract negotiations to actually advocate for like these broader issues. So for instance, like they advocated for, um, for students, for like student housing because they, student homelessness was a big issue in their community. So it wasn't just about, you know, wages or working conditions, it was also, let's try to bargain over things that we know are going to help sort of our broader communities or bargaining, bargaining for the common good is kind of this, the term that they used. And so I, I see, because there are so few sectors of work, um, one, you know, there, there are so few sectors of work that have a strong presence of, of like working class people or organized labor. Um, and because schools are so are so fundamental to communities everywhere. I, I think teachers have a, a really important role to play in kind of leading this edge of, you know, this, the CTU Chicago Teachers Union in Chicago is really pushing like progressive politics in the city or like one of the major forces um, politically that can actually advocate for spend like public spending um, or progressive taxation or kind of broader ways of giving their communities resources. That's, that's good. And I'm, I'm probably more on the fence than I should be, but it's <laughs> because I just, I like, I could walk through any school and I, this sounds terrible, but I, 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 I do believe this. I could walk through any school. And if you let me hang out for like two weeks and just sort of check out the teachers and more importantly, just talk to the students you, know, you could, I could probably just fire five, five to 10% of any school. The problem is you don't necessarily have anyone better to hire. Right. And so like, you can't be quick to unload your, your, your lesser teachers because you don't know if there's anyone better there. And so then on the other side, it's like, but with unionization, we can secure better work conditions, pay and benefits, which mm. might make the job more attractive, which might create the opportunity to fill the gaps. The problem is you then cannot turn around and fire the teachers now because we have the union, right? So for me, I'm like, in the end, I'm probably signing the card and I'm, you know, I'm in, but I do it, I do it reluctantly because I do see like there are some potential, you know, negatives or drawbacks. I agree. I think in the end, it's probably a net benefit, not just to the teachers, but to the broader community. But I'm probably more hesitant about, it. I think, you know, for most teachers, they're just going to sign it, and not think about it, or they've already taken the position they're anti-union and they're not going to consider it. And like, mm -hmm. I, I occupy this, this sort of this middle space where I'm like, yes, but, you know, and so it's like, yes, I'll sign it, you know, but, and this, this came up and I don't, I don't know how much this factors into your research or, or the book specifically, but I'm, I'm curious. I've had a lot of conversations recently about school choice. That's sort of one of the big political movements going on, you know, a lot of discussion about school choice nationwide. Uh, I've recently made the argument that that's one of the top reasons that so many schools were reopening, like as the pandemic was hitting its mm -hmm. peak yeah. in January, like where I work, they're like, all right, hey, you're going back in like a month. And it's like, yeah, but we're like at the worst point in it. Now numbers are dropping now. So, you know, it's, it's, it's looking okay. Um, but it, it, people kept saying like, I don't understand why they would do it. And I was like, a lot of this has to do with school choice. That if you don't reopen those schools and get people in person in the building, there's a lot of state legislatures that are very serious about potentially creating these choice opportunities, vouchers, yeah. you know, funding the students directly, et cetera. And so something that I've asked a few people I've talked to who are school choice advocates, because again, I, I don't like the idea of abandoning uh, such a developed system that does or can do so many good things. But I also think there's a lot of things that choice would offer that schools currently don't, you know, they, they, you create a lot of flexibility and, and things like that. So one of the questions that I've asked, I've asked them and the people I've talked to are split, but usually will agree with this. I said, would you be willing to trade off and say, get school choice? If on the other hand, every teacher in public and private schools could collectively bargain one union for every educator in your state. And it, it's like I said, roughly split, but most, a, a little over half of the school choice advocates I've talked to said that, that that's a concession they'd be willing to make because hmm. they, you know, and I'm like, well, that's fine. But it's such a tricky topic politically and economically and community to community. For you, how much has school choice factored into say your research and your thoughts on school? And would the union piece actually 
matter. Like, I think that would make a big difference in the, in the dynamic, but I have zero research to support it. I just look at that, you know, purely logic. Where's the school choice piece sort of fit in with unions and improving schools? Yeah. Um, what, what unions should offer is not like protection against any firing, say of bad teachers, but like a process for doing that. And I think, I mean, I think some of the, like, there's, there's so much scrutiny on teachers because, you know, being anti-teachers union is such a big part of the, the right. Um, it's very true. But I think it, like, if you looked at, if, if you looked at any other workplace, right, like you could also find bad workers in any workplace, but I think yeah. it's, a, it's not actually that like teachers are sort of uniquely bad. I think it's just that they, they've gotten so much scrutiny and I would hope, and I think this is how most of sort of the process works is like, you can't just fire someone for no reason. You have to go through a process, but like teachers do get fired, even if they are unionized. So hope, I mean, so yeah, I would yeah. and, and, hope and te- for that and, kind of, And yeah. to be fair with it, a teacher turn, even, even disregarding people who leave by choice. If you just look at people who either, you know, quit, resign, or are sort of forced to resign, Turnover Mm -hmm. in public education is about the same or in some cases a little higher than a lot of other industries. So I I don't mean to present it as like teachers never get fired or can't. I just I worry about adding any extra security to the handful of bums that you see anywhere. But to your point, those bums exist in every sector and in every every workplace. (laughs) But yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, And then so I think the question about school choice and the reopening debates. I mean, I, it's, I, I think it's been really interesting to see how quickly um, sort of the like, let's open schools, the, the like the pr- pro reopening um, contingent, like were pitted against teacher unions when really like everyone had the same goal, right? Like teachers want to go back to in-person they just wanted certain condition safety conditions to be met first. So like you could have, we could have had a really maybe like a, a, a more successful and like joint movement for te- teacher vaccination and like ventilation in all schools or something like those could have been the demands that would rally parents and teachers and sort of communities together. Um, whereas what we saw instead was, you know, I think a campaign that sort of pitted these interests against each other. I think it has this, it's, it's this watching this sort of reopening debate has been unsettling because I think it totally does give a lot of credence to advocates of school choice. You know, when you can say, oh, like public schools aren't open, which, you know, I think is really the fault of like them not having enough resources, but you can say, oh, public schools aren't open. Well, these other private schools are like, we should, we should be able to send our children there. But I think again, with, with any sort of system where like some people can opt out and often of sort of a more wealthy um, or white parents can opt out, then I think it creates, it just sort of deepens inequalities already in the system rather than you know, trying to find this common ground, like we want all schools to be successful and to be well-funded. Like, why don't we work together to try to fund that publicly um, for everyone? Um, And I'll just add, you know, I, in, in, in my book, I talk um, about the way that the, I look at both private and public education and there's sort of interesting interactions and in the early 20th century before the rise of public high schools or kind of at the very early stages, there are a lot of um, private, essentially for-profit business colleges or business schools, sometimes they're called commercial colleges that sort of offer training um, to, again, to people who want to enter white collar jobs. And a big argument for opening public high schools is we need to like cut down on this for-profit sector that's exploiting our students and making them pay too much for this kind of training. Um, So I think there's always this like private public dynamic, but um, like large in Boston, you know, communities supported a free public alternative to these schools that otherwise you had to pay a lot of money to enter. Um, So 
I would I would hope that you know we can see we can see this as sort of an effort to or we could we could try to create a movement that would like unite interest to actually create a more successful public sector rather than fragmenting into right. private that, yeah yeah sector. and that that's kind of my big concern like there's a lot of things and and I've got some episodes coming out real soon here with t- talking about the choice idea and in in abstract, without any of like the the community and political things, like thinking for individual students, I'm like, I don't know. There's a lot of good things going on with the idea of being able to choose a program that fits you or your interests, your goals, you know, whatever. However, it also fragments what in a lot of places is one of the one of the only public institutions that actually anchors people together. Like I live in a mm-hmm. in a very small town called Berryville, and um, I talked to a guy who was running for the county board of supervisors. And we just sort of talked about like, you know, since you're going to be playing part of the budgetary process, what are your views on schools, et cetera. And something that he came back to, and we actually ended up talking a lot about was that especially in rural communities, schools become like the anchor because mm-hmm. like what, what contact do you have with your government? You know, it's schools, it's police. Right. And that's usually a negative interaction, uh, paying your taxes, not usually feeling great about it. like <laughs> how many places do you actually directly interact with a government agency and feel good about it? And, and, you know, one of the only ones that people have consistent contact with are schools. And right. so the idea of, of, you know, somehow undercutting that institution, I think is a, is a, is a huge gamble at a minimum and possibly, possibly just a bad step in general. But on the other hand, I have a hard time arguing against the idea that if you could create a school that works better or that is more flexible to students' needs, you know, and so for your, your book, you're pointing out that schools you know, sort of can't solve social inequality, that we need to fix an economy, we need to fix communities, and then schools will, by default, they'll sort of follow along because they'll go with the funding, the health of the community, et cetera. That being said, if schools are at least complicit in the inequalities that we see, is it crazy for people to consider the alternative? I'm not asking you to advocate for choice or against it specifically. Mm. I'm saying like, if, if from your perspective, if public schools are not necessarily solving inequalities. Maybe they're not causing it, but if, the, if that's not the primary way to, to solve it, then is opting out a crazy idea for individual families? I would still argue that like public education um, historically has been a working class demand, like free, you know, if to the extent that education helps somebody if we're just looking at sort of the vocational role, but like to the extent that education actually has helped people get jobs um, and access other benefits in the economy, then I think making those resources free and publicly available to everybody is like a minimum step. So I would say that actually, and, and it's interesting, like we've talked a few times about how like schools have taken on sort of all these different social functions and they're like one of the few places you interact with government. I think in some ways like the US welfare state, because there hasn't been enough support, you know, for other kinds of social welfare programs, like schools have sort of been an easier political sell like to expand the welfare state. So, you know, we have vaccination programs that started in schools or, you know, free lunch or free breakfast programs in schools. So schools have kind of been a way to address as many, you know, as many different kinds of social welfare issues, um, more so than than just like learning or training for work. But I would say, like, to the extent that it, we see it as a public or as an important resource for an individual, it should be free and public. And like, just like high schools were made free in the early 20th century and knocked out this like for profit sector. I think there's, you know, it seems like a no brainer, you know, college should be free. We students shouldn't have to go into debt to get a college education. We shouldn't have like a small, but very um, exploitative sector of for-profit schools that can kind of take advantage of students. So my argument is like, you know, that's sort of a minimum, but beyond that, we need to think about broader economic realities of like, where, whether there are jobs for people to go into right. and, and we need, you know, more than just schools. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and we can do a lot of these things better. I, I like how you point to the, you know, the, the logical conclusion would be to increase, you know, sort of free access to college. Um, 
something that I, I don't know. I like, I have enough of these conversations with people and I like, I hear like all these cool ideas and I, I hang on to a few of them. And the problem is sometimes I remember who said it and sometimes I don't. So I'm <laughs> like, that's my idea. And it probably wasn't, but I, I'm really having trouble with like the timelines, like the idea of say like the learning loss thing, like kids are six months behind. It's like behind what, like you're not behind anything. Yeah. You'll figure it out when you need to. And cause you know, five years after high school, you forgot most of the stuff you learned in high school anyway. So if we're really serious about learning loss, like let, let's, let's make people keep learning. You know, you wouldn't just write mm -hmm. them off at the age of 18. Yeah. It, it wouldn't be crazy to say that every person should be able to access a school. And even if you want to like cap the credit hours, you know, everybody gets nine free credit hours of high school or college or whatever. And that we just give people the opportunity. And again, if we think education is important, I, I think you could do it. There's no reason that we set an arbitrary age at which you do or don't right. have access to it. If we really, as a culture care about education, the way we, we claim to. So we're going to get ready to wrap up in just a couple minutes here. And usually the last question is for book or movie recommendations, which could be fun, mm. could be serious, could be a combination. That's literally anything that you think people should check out. Before we jump into that, though, I'll give you a moment for an open mic. Uh, you can plug your own book, of course, but is there anything that we either talked about that you feel like, you know, we didn't do service to or I, I rushed through or anything that you want to talk about that we didn't get to? Um, I think we we covered a lot. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I always sort of say like, sometimes you could, you might read the argument or the takeaway of, of my book as sort of saying like, schools are bad or like they don't matter. And I think um, really it's about like trying to, um, trying to uncover the way that schools, you know, have historically fit into our larger political economy. So all of the many of the problems that we have in the world today are reflected in our school system. And hopefully that, you know, that just provides a more clear eyed analysis of, of what the limits limits can be, but also maybe some of the opportunities. Um, so I'll, I'll just add that. Yeah, no, it's good. And I, I, you know, I always say, if you want to, if you want an easy look at like how things are going in the United States, the, the two, the two best sort of microcosms to learn, you know, symbolically are, are public schools and oddly enough, the NFL, like <laughs> look at, look at the way, look at like what we value or how players do and don't talk. Yeah. Like, but if you, if you want to just get like an easy sort of, you know, snapshot of how things are going, there's the places to look. And, and I, I think you're right that schools both offer that, but maybe also offer some ideas about how we can do things better, not just in schools, but outside as well. Um, mm -hmm. so for books and movies, and again, personal or professional or whatever, obviously anyone who hasn't read the education trap schools <laughs> and the remaking of inequality in Boston, those people are losers, right? So th <laughs> obviously we they need everyone to read that, uh, in addition to, and again, you can hit on that one as well, but w what do you think people should check out, uh, for whatever reason you like? Um, yeah, so I think one one book that I use in my history of education class that I teach with um, is called A Fight for the Soul of Public Education. That's by Stephen Ashby and Robert Bruno. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a history of the Chicago teachers strike of 2012. Um, but I think they do a good job in that book of sort of talking about like very recent education policy and then what the whole, you know, what the movement was for how you actually organize a campaign. Um, and I think, you know, because Teacher Strike was in 2012, since then the landscape of teaching and education has changed a lot. But I think this was sort of a, a pivotal moment in like recent history of K through 12 education. Um, it's a useful and, I, and like compelling book, I think, to learn a little bit about what's going on now. I'll say another another book similar to like the theme of my book, um, but it's about the present um, is called Pedigree, How Elite Students Get Elite Jobs. And this is sort of like an ethnography of really how like the elite corp or economic elite is reproduced through schools. Um, and so it's by Lauren Rivera, who follows kind of like graduates, but also recruiters who come to college from like elite, you know, corporate law and consulting backgrounds and basically shows how like these jobs select out for all, um, all kinds of reasons that are not just about academic skill, <laughs> but also kind of, you know, selecting back out a 
uh, like wealthy students who kind of have the cultural habits of the elite. So if you're interested in like elite formation, that's a kind of cool study about the present. Awesome. And I'll add one movie that isn't about education, but uh, Boots Riley, Sorry to Bother You is probably one of my favorite movies of like recent years. Um, and it's one of the few movies that features a, un a like organizing campaign, but and also just like reflection on the monotony and um, conditions of work now, as well as like racism in the workplace. Uh, but it's kind of a dystopian, um, surreal film that's a lot of fun awesome awesome good list and that's <laughs> i i you know not not to not to discriminate against any of the other guests but i feel like a, a growing trend is that when i talk to people who work at the college level i get really awesome recommendations for the books <laughs> like oh, there's, there's, there's like a that, no it's good it's good that these are these will get added to my list because it sounds like the kind of stuff that i like to talk about <laughs> with friends when they'll tolerate me or on the podcast in general. Fantastic. So if any listeners want to learn more or get in touch with you, uh, one, uh, how do they go about getting the book? And then two, what are some ways that guests could possibly contact you if they had questions or want to continue the conversation? Um, so the best way is to check out my website, which is Tina Groger. Groger is G-R-O-E-G-E-R.com. Um, and that has information about the book and like a contact my email so you can get in touch with me that way fantastic and i'll make sure i link that as, as well as the book itself when is the book is the book out now or it's coming soon you can buy it already now yeah um it's i think like amazon is already selling it so oh. yeah it's it's like available now Fantastic. All right. So this has been the Class Cast podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we've been speaking with Tina Groger about her book, The Education Trap, Schools and the Remaking of Inequality in Boston, as well as just general ideas about how we can improve education and maybe what we need to do to improve society so that schools will follow along on that, uh, on that same trajectory. Tina, thank you very much for taking the time to talk today. Yeah, no, thank you for th giving me the opportunity to come on the show. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.